So today's is about suicide and mental health. So we welcome you to this forum. Feel free and by the end of the session, in case you have any questions that you'd like answered, then uh, we'll be able to answer them. So what we are going to have is back-to-back -back, uh, presentations uh, from different speakers and the topic is on mental health and suicide. So we welcome you to this session. I am your host, Dr. Rebecca Wambua, an educationalist who has 32 years of experience, 18 teaching at the school level and 14 at the university. So we welcome you to this session. Feel free to interact with us. As we are having the presentations, you can be writing down uh, your questions on the chat or you note them down somewhere such that at the end of the presentations, we are going to have an interactive session. So welcome once again. And our first speaker is Elizabeth, Elizabeth Karanja. And I'm going to introduce her so that she can begin the presentation. Elizabeth Wanjugu Karanja is a Kenya registered psychiatric nurse at Matharia National Teaching and Referral Hospital. And she's going to present uh, the first session and the topic is signs of suicidal tend tendencies. So what are the signs of a person maybe who is thinking of committing suicide? So Elizabeth, we welcome you to begin. All right, welcome. Thank you. So I have, as you have heard, I'm Elizabeth Karanja. And uh, I'm presenting to you the signs uh, of suicide. So the first sign is that those patients, they verbalize, uh, okay, rather we call them, and they verbalize on committing, committing suicide, threatening to hurt themselves, and sometimes they deliberately hurt themselves. Another sign is the feeling they feel anxious and making a plan of even uh, the ways on how to die, like purchasing pesticides. They also purchase ropes and even identifying where they can maybe complete that suicide. Number three, we have previous suicide attempts whereby there, there was a, a research done by Bilsen in 2018, whereby approximately 25 to 33 cases of suicide were preceded by the earlier attempts, which was uh, the and the prevalent uh, in boys was higher than in girl, girls. Then number four, we have social withdrawal. These uh, clients, Sometimes they withdraw themselves from the rest of the family or friends and self-isolate themselves. So number five, we have seen, they, they also say goodbye to the family members and also giving out uh, important items <coughs> or even making will. Then number six, we have depression whereby they display uh, extreme mood swings and experience severe emotional distress with suicidal thoughts. This is another research that had been done by Fulgis in 2020. Another sign, we have post-traumatic stress disorder, which has not been properly addressed. Again, it's a research that had been done uh, in 2011. Number eight, we also have them talking of unworthiness. Others, they, they become hopeless. And uh, this one, uh, there is a research that had been done by somebody called Beck and, and he had de developed a, a hopelessness scale, which he exam uh, examined two, of, two or seven patients with the suicidal ideations, whereby 14 of them, they completed the suicide. And then, uh, again, he also did another one, and out of 98, 1958 outpatients, 17 of them, they also completed suicide. 
uh, by 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 having dangerous risks such as driving extremely fast because they are aiming at uh, they are aiming at dying of suicide number 9 we have them mm. who also have self negligence as a result of abusing drugs or alcohol substance abusers have been reported okay. to commit uh, to complete suicide more than non substance abusers number 10 mm. we also have uh, those who are, are, are about eating habits some of them mm. they eat very little as compared to what they used to take while others refuse to uh, to feed completely this uh, they aim at uh, Mm. We were told not committing suicide, but dying of suicide. So where is it now? What's going on again, Okay, the other one is number eleven, whereby we experience some sleeping problems. Some people will sleep excessively than usual, and while others experience lack of sleep or even rest sleep, these are the signs of uh, uh, suicides suicide that i have been able to come up with and uh, these are my references god bless you thank you okay thank you you can stop sharing yeah. thank you for uh, discussing the signs of a person maybe who has suicidal tendencies now i'm sure maybe we are wondering how do we help a person uh, who is thinking of committing suicide Maybe we have seen those signs and we are wondering how to help. So Dr. Zablon Nyaberi is going to discuss that. He's going to discuss how to handle a person with suicidal tendencies. Dr. Zablon is a mental health specialist and a lecturer of psychiatry at Masinde Moliro University of Science and Technology. Dr. Zablon, you are welcome. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Victor, I will share the PowerPoint presentation on my behalf. And uh, uh, before we talk about um, uh, management of uh, suicide, uh, there are a few clarifications that I would like uh, to make. That uh, whereas suicide is death, caused by the intentional act of self-harm that is designed to be little. We have what we call suicidal behavior, which encompasses a spectrum of behaviors from suicide attempts and preparatory behaviors uh, to completed uh, uh, suicide. And uh, in management, we are aiming at whatever uh, preventing uh, uh, patients from reaching uh, uh, that stage of completed uh, suicide. Uh, then um, people, when people are planning or they attempt uh, suicide, they use different uh, methods. Uh, which um, include uh, taking poison or drug overdose, uh, self-inflicted injury, and there are several other methods that uh, different people use. And those ones are important when especially it comes to uh, emergency medical management of a patient who has attempted uh, a suicide. Now, I want us to understand that uh, suicidal risk is dynamic. And uh, those ones who have been uh, called upon to manage suicidal behavior or patients who have suicidal behavior uh, we should uh, employ a caring response we should provide brief interventions 
and they should endeavor to communicate with the family and the close friends of the patient. And then the last one is uh, uh, important. Patients who have, who have su suicidal behavior should be referred for appropriate professional care. Uh, we should also become aware that any suicidal act, regardless of we whether it's a gesture or an attempt, must be taken seriously. And in terms of management, there is need to conduct what we call an initial assessment, which can be done by a healthcare professional who has been trained in the assessment and the management of suicidal behavior. And then uh, after that um, initial assessment, uh, depending on uh, the condition of the patient, uh, then uh, they will be provided, they'll be given what we call whatever emergency uh, medical care, which will uh, depend on uh, uh, the method that they used to attempt suicide. Uh, if it is poisoning, uh, there is a care that is appropriate for patients who have uh, attempted uh, suicide uh, by way of uh, poisoning. If it is serving inflicted injury, uh, there are several care modalities that are available. And then once the patient stabilize, then uh, they should. Uh, have a thorough suicide risk assessment, which, and this can be done by a psychiatrist, a psychologist, or any other a trained mental healthcare practitioner, and it should be done as soon as possible. Uh, and then uh, after that assessment, then a decision would be made whether that patient uh, will need to be admitted voluntarily or involuntarily for treatment and whether the restraints uh, will need to be used. If a patient has a psychiatric, an underlying psychiatric illness, uh, then they should get admitted to a psychiatric unit for uh, psychiatric uh, management. Uh, what then uh, involves whatever suicide risk assessment? Uh, well, these are some of the things that uh, uh, suicide risk assessment will entail. I will not go into all of them. There's, it enables whatever establishment of rapport and listening to the patient narrative, which is very important. And then uh, it also enables uh, 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 professionals to understand uh, the suicide attempt, the, 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 the background, and the events preceding that attempt and the circumstances in, in which it occurred. It's also important to inquire about mental health symptoms and other medications or alternative treatments that the patient may be taking for treatment of their mental health uh, condition or for relief of symptoms. Uh, and then uh, it's also important that uh, a full assessment of uh, the mental status of that patient is conducted with a particular emphasis on identifying depression uh, and other mental health issues. It's also important that uh, personal and family relationships, as well as the social networks that that particular patient has are understood. 
uh, because these ones will uh, be extremely important uh, to the suicide attempt uh, uh, and uh, the subsequent uh, follow-up in terms of treatment. Uh, it's also important during that uh, uh, suicide risk assessment to inquire about the presence of uh, a firearm or other lethal means uh, that could be available where that particular patient uh, uh, stays. And uh, subsequently, lethal means counseling should be provided, which um, involves facilitating the safe storage or disposal of the lethal means away from the home or where the patient uh, stays. Then uh, after that assessment, then uh, safety planning should be done. Uh, and this one is essential as it helps the patient to identify triggers to suicidal planning. And uh, together with uh, the professional, the patient will be assisted to uh, develop plans or come up with the strategies that will enable them to deal with suicidal thoughts when those suicidal thoughts uh, come. Then now uh, a patient will be provided with uh, crisis resources, uh, counseling uh, on the removal or a storage of lethal means and will be done. And uh, then uh, referrals for appropriate risk reduction care will be done. And some of uh, uh, the strategies uh, or psychotherapeutic techniques that can be used to uh, reduce uh, risk uh, include uh, cognitive behavior therapy, which is very common in our uh, setting here in Kenya. Uh, and then uh, we also have collaborative assessment and management of uh, suicidality. And then the last one is on uh, family therapy. We must, the, the, the care provider should uh, 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 have a discussion with the uh, the family of that patient so that they can understand uh, the emotional reactions that they are going to have. And uh, most probably whatever assist that patient uh, because they're the ones who are going to stay with that patient when they eventually get uh, discharged. And then uh, follow-up care is important because uh, attempting suicide in itself becomes a risk factor for, uh, 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 for suicide. Uh, and so follow-up care is extremely important. Uh, then um, I want to mention something about uh, prevention of suicidal behavior uh, and the strategies uh, uh, that can be used to uh, prevent suicidal uh, behavior. And this one requires identification of uh, uh, people who are, who are at risk of, of uh, attempting suicide and then uh, initiating appropriate public health interventions to reduce uh, their risk. And these are uh, the strategies include establishment of outreach uh, programs, uh, creating awareness and uh, uh, screening people for risk. And then uh, there's another one that is important here, uh, provision of gatekeeper uh, training where uh, people in key frontline roles like teachers, uh, parents and peers are trained on how to recognize suicide risk and intervene accordingly. Uh, Basically, that is it. Management uh, basically is about whatever assessment 
uh, over uh, risk behavior, and then uh, uh, depending on the findings of that assessment, then the patients will be the patient will be put on uh, appropriate uh, treatment by a professional. We have professionals who can uh, come in and assist uh, these patients. That's all that I have for now. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Zablon, uh, for that presentation. Uh, participants, in case you have any questions that you'd like answered, uh, feel free and write somewhere. You can write on the chat or note it somewhere in your notebook. Then at the end of the presentations, we'll be free to interact with the specialists and ask questions. Our next presenter is uh, Wairimo, Wairimo Karongo. Uh, she's going to present on uh, suicide prevalence in public service. Wairimo is a counseling psychologist with the Ministry of Health deployed in Kemsa. She is highly experienced having worked in various governmental institutions for the last 27 years in various capacities. She rose from the humble beginning as a classroom teacher in 1994 to her current position as deputy director of psychological counseling. Wairimo is a member of Kenya Counseling Psychological Association. Welcome, Wairimo. Yeah, my name is Wairimo Karongo, working in the Ministry of Health as a counseling psychology. Today, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the prevalence of uh, suicide among the public servants. And uh, apart from that, I have uh, somebody I have worked with. He's known as Crispus Kiamba. Crispus Kiamba. And I went um, a lot of uh, st uh, struggle to come out of addiction. And at one point of his life, he had attempted suicide. <clears throat> so you give a, a brief encounter about suicide. So uh, once I'm done with my presentation, he'll come in and give something about uh, suicide. I think it is, it is okay now. Yeah. Yes, we can see the presentation. I can't move. So I have talked a little bit about it. I know the area presenters have, have uh, said a, lot, a bit of what I'm sharing. So I'll actually move very fast. <clears throat> Suicide, I'm sure it has been defined and the figures have been given, <clears throat> but you can see World Health Organization says that about 700,000 people die of suicide every year. And uh, in Africa, in Africa, 11, 11, out of every 100,000 people dies from suicide. And okay, that is the world figure, 11 out of every 100,000 people. And in Africa, nine out of every 100,000 people dies from suicide. And figures in Kenya are 6.1, 6.1%. That is quite high. For, for Kenya. So, and uh, of course, you know that most of these suicidal deaths, they are not uh, reported because there is a lot of uh, discrimination. There is a lot of stigmatization and a lot of, you know, the family feels guilty. Like uh, it, was, it was their fault or some, they, there is something they should have done so you'll find them talking mostly that the person died from short illness. So most of those deaths go unreported. 
So when you talk about 6.1 out of every 100,000 people, if every death from suicide was reported, I believe the figures could be much higher. And uh, just like everybody else is uh, experiencing distress, we have a high level of distress among civil servants. For example, just recently I was looking at, um, in fact, it was in Daily Nation last week, they were talking about the, the rate of uh, suicide among the physicians were reporting that this could be a, as a result of uh, job hazards that are causing distress among the, among the physicians. And uh, those are the figures they had given. Some of the health workers have reported harmful use of alcohol, 3.9%. Then 49.49% of health workers have reported post-traumatic stress disorder. 40% have reported anxiety, while 37% reported depression. Of course, these mental disorders, untreated, they are the ones that cause uh, people to get suicidal ideation because they feel uh they feel overwhelmed by whatever they are going through these are some of the co uh, common causes of uh, suicidal ideation uh I, I believe they have also been tackled so you can see some of them and these are common among the public servants and even among the general public uh we have a financial distress. This is very common. Most of those people who are working, they are, they are, there is so much pressure on them from families, from friends, from relatives, especially, you know, now how economy of our country is. So people are relying on the few people who are working. Therefore, there is a lot of financial distress. There is bullying, discrimination. You might be wondering, where is bullying in public service? Yes, particularly when you look at the, 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 the police force, for example, because of this um, ranking and orders and that kind of thing, so there is a lot of bullying, there is a lot of discrimination. If you are working in an organization where you are maybe the only one from your community, the other people are from another community, there is a lot of discrimination, <clears throat> sexual, verbal, and domestic abuse. This is common, particularly in the lower cadre staff. They have reported some harassment from their seniors. There is physical abuse. Sometimes you get even public servants, some of them engaging in, in fights. The same public servants are, are, have families, so they will be affected by marital issues, bereavement of loved ones, loss of livelihood. For example, currently I'm in Kemsa. There is a lot of fear because they are expecting restructuring of uh, the organization. So there is a lot of fear, and I've talked to some people who have uh, felt that uh, suicide was uh, their, an option for them. So I've been talking to some people and even with the help of colleagues, they have helped the colleagues who have been overwhelmed by the fact that they may lose their jobs. And next, next. So that is somebody who has a lot of stress, signs, warning signs of suicide. These ones have been given, but of course, this one is you can you can also encounter someone talking or writing a lot about dying or suicide. We have a comment of hopelessness, helplessness, worthlessness, 
expression of having no reason to live, increased uh, alcohol or drug intake, withdraw from friends, families, and community, reckless behaviors, uh, dramatic mood change, all this can uh, be signs that somebody is experiencing a hard time. So there are, there are things we can uh, look out. Next one. Next. Next. Yeah, this is the continuation, the rate. But I've said that what we have, what we have among the public servants may not really, just move to the next one, please. This one I've already looked at. I've said that the figures are liberal because most of the suicide, some of the suicide uh, cases are not reported. People say that somebody died from uh, short illness. In fact, it is the families that work hard to hide you might find somebody is very senior in government. How will we explain he's a senior government employee? He has money. I don't want to say that it's shame. We have already talked about how to manage a person uh, who has attempted suicide. I think we were given details by Dr. Zablon. And I think that was the end of her presentation. Chair, why can't you, if the person is around, the testimony she can be moved in? If you are still with us, already logged in. Oh, yeah. The person giving us the testimony, yes. Hmm. I think if he was already prepared, he was already, or he's been already been prepared for it, he can be given a chance. Chris Pannis? Yeah. Chris Karibu? Yeah. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, yes. please continue. Thank you. Um, okay. I'm, I'm Crispus. Crispus Gilai Kimaru, not Kiamba. She has uh, said I'm Kiamba, I'm not Kiamba. Um, I'm a recovering alcoholic, five years sober. And um, before that, I struggled with the alcoholism for uh, 17 years since 1999. And um, I'm, I'm a trained teacher, trained high school teacher. And um, I started drinking in 1999 when I was in form three. And uh, after that, uh, um, I, I think I fell into addiction very fast because of uh, underlying issues. And we, by the time I was going to college in 2002, I was already um, badly off. So all through college, four years in more university, I was drinking a lot. I would um, sleep on the streets. I would uh, mess a lot, blackouts and all that. And uh, after college, um, luckily I was able to complete college, though I was drinking badly. I was drinking everything and anything, including Changa, Busa. And I was also, uh, because I, I had, uh, I struggled with uh, low self-esteem. So, I didn't have any uh, sexual relationship. I did have a, sorry, a relationship. I did have a girlfriend and I would find, I uh, eventually fell into uh, going to brothels and uh, prostitutes and all that. Maybe to mask, mask my uh, shortcomings. And uh, I, the first job I got in uh, after college was a teaching job in a private school, but I only went, I continued uh, for about a few months. Then I went to Safaricom. Uh, luckily, I got a job at Safaricom, full-time and employed. You can imagine uh, uh, having trained as a teacher and then you get a job at one of the best paying companies in the country. So um, it was to be the beginning of my good life, but uh, I was still drinking badly. So what happened, as they say, uh, pesa mingi, uh, mashida mingi. So I started drinking even more. And uh, you see, during the training, uh, when we were joining Safaricom, no one noted because, of course, I would not go drunk. But immediately I started working. That was in 2008. I started mi missing work. 
and um, I started borrowing money because even the salary, and it was a lot of money back then, that was uh, 70, 80,000 and bonuses, a lot of uh, bonuses here and there. And um, the drinking got worse. Um, I was even taken for counseling uh, after missing work for so long. Sometimes I would even miss work for two weeks and still the company would come looking for me. But uh, one, thing, one thing I knew, um, I had uh, one thing I had discovered by then um, in, in college, I was taking a, a, a degree in education uh, you know, and uh, there were some aspects of psychology. So I, I, our lecturers would talk about you know, psychoanalysis and all that. And I did a lot of research and I, I discovered there were problems I had, issues like uh, low self-esteem, uh, growing up with this strict dad who would always, I would say I suffered emotional abuse. Actually, I was telling my sisters that and my brothers today and we were arguing. They, they don't know, they don't understand what emotional abuse is. We, we grew up under one of the strict, uh, he, he would even, uh, he was not so violent, but I think he was just projecting on us after losing so much of uh, maybe his uh, career or his business. And uh, actually four of us became alcoholics, my, my three brothers and myself. And um, I, I maybe that's, that's one thing that uh, I can explain what happened later. So uh, after Safaricom, uh, in Safaricom eventually, um, after so many disciplinary cases, I stopped going to work. I wasn't even sacked. I stopped going to work. It was 2011, and they looked for my for me. They looked for my next of kin, who was my sister, and they eventually gave her the termination letter. Actually, they begged her if there was anything else they could do. I was I was not to be found anywhere, and that uh, by that time I had sold everything in the house. I had so much eating me inside my, my myself, but I didn't know how to resolve it. And even the casting session, because I was not I was not dedicated, they did help a lot. I ended up in Karibangi and uh, Korogosho slums, where now I you would find me washing bars in the morning, just to get a drink, I would sleep. Uh, sometimes I didn't even have anywhere to sleep. You can imagine from Safaricom to sleeping on the streets. <laughs> sometimes I'd find myself under a truck in the morning. I wouldn't even know how I ended up there. And uh, it was an embarrassing life. I remember in 2012, my mom sent my younger brother to come for me. And they found me somewhere in a, in a Changa den and uh, they, they loaded me to a matatu to Nyeri. I come from Nyeri. And uh, that's how I got myself in Karachina, uh, back in the village. I stayed for a month or so. They cooked for me. My, my mom would cry looking at my, my dad didn't even want to talk to me. It was so stressful. And then uh, that's how I applied for my uh, high school teaching job because I was a trained teacher and I got the job easily. And then I became a high school teacher starting 2013. I got the job in tw October 2012. And then I started uh, officially in uh, January 2013. But now the money came after three months, uh, 90,000. That was like a million for me, having stayed so long without uh, seeing money or touching money. The drinking started again. Uh, I got myself into the same mess, prostitutes in Karatina town, uh, missing work, warnings. I had settled with a, with a lady and uh, with no time she, she was pregnant and it became worse, we were fighting, I was stressed up, I was fighting, we were arguing, my parents, everyone, I, I was messing up a lot. Loans again, loans, CRB and so much. Uh, in 2014, um, around February, I felt like um, I had these suicidal thoughts uh, all through. All through my drinking, I had suffered with those because I knew I was this bright chap and I wasn't maximizing my, um, my ability. And uh, I knew I wanted to be a good father, I, I maybe a good brother, a good son, but I wasn't every time I tried. I was a good writer. I was a poet. I, I had even published works on uh, Daily Nation, my short stories, uh, po poems on standard, but I wasn't going through it. Nothing, I, I, I wasn't um, maybe perfecting anything in my life. And I was feeling inadequate. My, my classmates from uh, Kenyaga High School, my, from secondary school were already driving big cars. And I was feeling really, I would see, meet them and maybe I, all, all I could do was maybe borrow 200 for the, from them or con them, uh, tell them my dad is sick and con them, get 500, drink. 
So in 2014, uh, my wife was uh, heavily pregnant, maybe three months to, uh, to the due date. And I felt I didn't want to be a father the way I was. And I felt now this was the time to act on those uh, suicidal thoughts. And because I knew I couldn't uh, go ahead with it while sober, I decided to, first of all, I planned it so well. It was on a Monday. I planned to sell the TV after my wife left. She was also a teacher. And that is exactly what I did. So I waited. Um, when she left, I took the TV. I went to Karatina. I, I sold the TV for around 6,000. And then we started drinking with buddies. People would ask me, hey, Mwarimo, why you are not going to work? I told them, I'm OK. I'm, this is a good day for me. And I was so courageous. I was feeling good because I felt this pain was now going to end. And uh, at around 11, I had a small phone. I called my mom. I told her I'm done. I sent texts to my teaching colleagues, to my wife, and I told all of them that I'm done and I will not hurt them anymore. So I went to an agro vet. I remember very well. I had even done some research on the best uh, herbicide to, to, to buy because that's the way I wanted to, uh, to, to end. I had already done research on so many ways to die, and I had even thought of going to Mombasa and jumping mm -hmm. into the sea. I had uh, thought of uh, maybe drinking and mixing alcohol with the uh, poison, but I found that maybe uh, herbicide, the chemical would finish off the job. I was really dedicated to doing it. So at ele uh, around 11 noon, I went to another bar. I bought the, uh, the, uh, the, the poison went to another bar and I sat down. I even bought a task. I wanted something high end because I was used to the, the, the cheap beers. I wanted to, to go to heaven. I thought I was going to heaven. I, I wanted to go to heaven uh, while high on something, you know, classy. And uh, that's how, that's what I did. I surveyed the toilet. I saw where I would uh, go. And uh, after a drink or two, I got the, now I got a mustard courage. And uh, I went to the toilet and, and I, I opened, I struggled opening the, the can. I didn't even have an idea that I should stop this. No, I did. I opened and the smell was so bad. So before I changed my mind, I drank it all. And uh, that's the last thing I remember from that incident until now I was in hospital, Jami Hospital in Karachina. And um, I, I, my eyesight wasn't there, but I could hear my mom speaking and my wife and some people. I, familiar places. And um, the worst of it was I had two pipes going through my nostrils to pump. So, uh, you know, they were pushing the pipes through my nostrils to the other to uh, pump the poison. It was so much. And they had uh, uh, tied my hand to the bed uh, because I was struggling a lot. And I, could, I, I, I didn't know that by that time my eyesight had been affected by the poison. And actually, I stayed that for almost three weeks. And, but after three weeks and a lot of medication, things got better. Then my eyesight uh, returned gradually. Um, it was the most painful thing. That, that night and the subsequent nights, it was the most painful thing. But still, uh, funny enough, I still knew my alcohol use would continue. Even while at that bed, even when the doctor came in, and, and, and it's funny because I, I remember when I, when I logged in uh, today, I had uh, a medical professional talking about what you're supposed to do. I remember them even uh, like mocking me, uh, asking me, wewe ni kijana mdogo, mwalimu, kona kazi ya serikali, mkunyo dawa, kwa ni nini na kusubua wewe? And, and they would mock me and now the other patients would hear and they would look at me weirdly. And uh, I don't think it was the it was handled the right way because I knew the stigma now would commence from that moment. And that is exactly what happened. Actually, even in my family, that thing was never ever talked about. And my sister, after almost uh, those, all those years, almost um, is it now eight years, she came to know about it in, when I talked about it in March, when I talked about it in the media, because I'm very active on media. She was shocked. My sister was asking, you mean, the stigma, as, as uh, uh, Wairimu, my, my, uh, my friend Wairimu was saying, the stigma is just too much. And um, now what I wanted to talk about is maybe 
uh, such kind of um, how you professionals, because I know we have so many professionals here in the mental health uh, area, how maybe you can treat uh, these patients better or you can treat us better. And then, uh, of course, maybe a research on, um, maybe we need to look at uh, alcohol use and, and uh, how it's related to suicide because all along uh, I have seen so many people uh, commit suicide or at, uh, not commit, sorry, um, we said we are not be using that. Uh, I have seen so many people attempt suicide or even talk about it while struggling with substances, especially alcohol and the others, because we, we reach a point where we feel we have broke, burnt so many bridges and we can't turn back. And because no one is listening, no one wants to understand, no one, no one can understand us, we, we, we end up uh, maybe going, going ahead with, it, with that, with, with the decision. And um, when we do that, uh, then again, we are, we are blamed. We are told we are weak, we are told we, we, we don't, uh, we should have talked to the pastor. We are, we are, and by the time I am ready, to, just consider this, by the time I'm ready to go ahead with such kind of pain, by the time I'm ready to take such kind of a, a pesticide or herbicide, and I can see what it does to animals or even um, weeds, I know it will hurt a lot physically, but it's because the pain I have inside is so much. And, and that's why I'm telling you guys, I was so happy when I was drinking those uh, last, few, last few drinks because I knew my pain was going to end. My psychological pain, the emotional pain, that pain of uh, alcoholism and struggling with uh, alcohol for those years. I had tried at a coca. I think in this country, I would get even born again two times in a day. And, and uh, you know, just to try and stop it. I have had uh, prophetesses pray for me uh, and uh, it wasn't working. So by the time I was deciding to uh, maybe take take that poison, it was because I had um, tried uh, maybe everything. Then to hear a mental health professional in hospital mocking me, now like, where we, and like where we have now, you don't have a brain. And then the other patients are there. I'm not even in any special ward. I was in just an ordinary ward. That, that, I think that hurt me a lot. So even when they recommended that I go to, you know, the diagnosis was mental psychosis or something like that, and they recommended I go to a psychiatrist, I was very enthusiastic. So I would go, I would be given fear, but I would, even after going to the psychiatrist, um, I would just go and drink after that because I felt like, these people, they, they, are, they are working in a, in a cohort uh, and they are not understanding me. So um, I, after that, um, I, I lost my teaching job again. I was interdicted the first time after, uh, in 2014. I was uh, uh, reinstated. I was interdicted again in 20, uh, 2015, the next year. And then um, I could not get my job back again. But uh, after uh, two more years of struggle in 2017, I was able to turn things around. I'm now um, five years sober. Uh, I am a trainee addiction counselor at SAPTA. And uh, also, more importantly, I do a lot of um, uh, um, alcohol use disorder uh, awareness and uh, I go to uh, for family interventions because uh, many families have been calling me after listening to my story. They tell me, come and talk to uh, maybe your loved one. He, maybe he can, you can relate, he can relate to you. And I, I, I just go. In where I'm called, I just go. So uh, that's my story. Maybe that's what Oirimo wanted me um, um, to talk about. I didn't have a presentation because my story is here. My story is my life. I have lived it. So I think uh, that's all I can say for now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, sharing. Maybe we can ask you at what point or what made you change. Maybe you'll answer that during the question and answer time. Okay, thank you, Chris, for that. Now, our next presenter is uh, Justin. And Justin, you'll just take 10 minutes because our time is so much spent. So Justin, you can be sharing as I introduce you. You can, you can be sharing your screen. Uh, Justin Kimani is going to present on stress management. He's a counseling psychologist 
a member of Kenya Counseling Psychologist, Psychologist Association, consultant in conflict management and a court accredited mediator and a certified addiction counselor. Welcome, Justin. Thank you, thank you, Malin. Thank you, Dr. Terry. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Very well, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Are you starting from the first one? You can begin from the first slide. Yes, I'll start from the first one. Mm -hmm. And I hope you can see my, my whole lot. Sometimes my parts are not available like the head, but I can see my whole, my head is there. So, yeah, so that's me. Yeah. Very well. Uh, I think the only thing you have not seen, Dr. Terry, is that uh, my, my practice is at uh, Valley Arcade. And I have an associate uh, office at Parklands where one of my associate consultants also uh, works. Um, and thank you very much for this uh, uh, chance. I don't want to go through the, the, the causes of mental health because that has been talked about enough, but at least you have had- Kindly do that. a slideshow. Uh -huh. Can you do a slideshow? Up. Okay. Is that not better? Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Um in the in the process I have lost my just go back to just scroll back. And then uh... okay. Can you see it now? Then do a slideshow. Right. So seeing that I don't want to, I, I wouldn't go through that because it's been covered fully. And during what has been covered, you have seen that stress, stress is a cause of, or is a condition that leads to, to mental uh, disorder. I, I'm not going to try and use those new terms because they've just been introduced and I'm not familiar with them. So if we have accepted that, or we have, we have been taught that stress is uh, a, a cause of, uh, or leads to uh, mental uh, illness. Uh, so what is stress? That's where I'm starting from. Uh, are you following? Are you, are you there with me? Yes. Proceed, proceed, so proceed. what is stress? So, because stress is a daily, uh, experience is part of life and therefore people take stress to be to, for granted in spite of what stress eventually does to us all. So and stress is, def, uh, is uh, defined uh, um, variously as the demand on the body and mind for adaptation uh, to change, uh, to challenges, to, 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 to challenges, yes. Um, it's a condition of, of feeling experienced when a person perceives that demand for energy, for the things that are required, such as the energy to do things, the knowledge to do them, the capacity to do them, the money to do them, the love needed, need and, and safety, that the demand for that exceeds the, the supply, the, the personal supply for them. That is how stress sets in. When the demand for resources is less than the supply of those resources. So we can, you can see the formula there that stress occurs when the pressure for the resources is greater than the resources themselves. So stress management means reducing or controlling stress, but not eliminating it at all altogether because it will keep coming back. But it's, it's, as we shall see later on, it's the ability to, be, to, to, to recognize it, to recognize how it comes about and trying to uh, uh, control, manage it. 
they are stressed as are those situations or conditions of people that uh, uh, trigger stress. And these stresses can be categorized into coming out of social factors, uh, such as our, our unmet expectations in, for example, relationships in families, uh, unmet expectations in socioeconomic um, life from the community or society, and expected expect, uh, unmet expectations from political formations like we have just gone through. Uh, we may have belonged to certain political uh, formations, but our expectations from the outcome of those formations have not been met. That is a source of stress. There are other uh, sources like physical and biological factors. For example, genetic makeup, uh, which determines an individual's response to, to stress. Genetic, if the way you look can cause a permanent stress to you if you're extremely ugly. And people, of course, look themselves through the mirror and see how they look. There's nothing you can do about that. Instead of acknowledging that you are God-made and wonderfully made, an image of God, you develop uh, stress. Some people without teeth, what can you do about that? You cannot uh, change that unless you put uh, uh, artificial ones. And even then, you don't look as normal as everyone else. Another defectiveness is... So... Uh, there are things you cannot do anything about that have happened. Once you realize this, this you can man, you can appreciate how you look and do not make that a cause of, of stress. Then there are emotional factors. Individuals react to situations by the developing either negative uh, emotions, such as anger, sadness, fear, grief, in case of loss and bereavement, and so on, or losses of other things, if, including property. But there are also positive emotions, which increase things like generosity, kindness, eagerness, and, and, and uh, the, the, the feelings of wanting to, uh, to help. So what are the early warnings of stress? You see, if you have, you're experiencing stress, you will feel low in energy, you might experience headaches, you may have a running stomach, upset stomach, including those ones listed there, diarrhea, constipation, nausea. You can have aches, pains and tens. I don't know how that, uh, you, I'm, I'm sure you also feel like I do sometimes, every part of your body is aching. Um, on the shoulders and other parts of your body are aching. These are warning signs of stress. Some people have chest pain, and you know that uh, chest pains and ra rapid heartbeat can lead, uh, can lead to heart problems, strokes, and so on. Insomnia, that is sleeplessness and restlessness. You can suffer from uh, frequent colds and infections. You lose sexual appetite and desire and ability to function sexually. Uh, nothing can cause you more. Uh, anxiety and stress than when your spouse, your partner, wants to share the sex experience with you, but you have none of it to offer. So what is then the relationship between stress and mental uh, conditions? And we have already seen it, that stress can be a mental condition. We are saying can, because it's not always cause of a mental condition. As we shall see, some stress is good and you need it. Every one of us needs stress so that you can do what you have to do within time, within target, and to have to, to, to meet your ambitions and aspirations. So not all stress is bad, depending on the level, as we shall see uh, shortly. And stress, therefore, for that purpose, can be categorized at three levels. The eustress level is positive, constructive, energizing tension uh, or pressure. So that it can enable you, it can prompt you, it can uh, trigger the, 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 the need 
to, 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 to work for what you want to achieve and to achieve, uh, to, 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 to meet your deadlines, to motivate people to perform in order to, in order to meet expected uh, targets. So that's a good level of stress called eustress. There is hyperstress, which is condition where stress response is stimulated too often for too long, St uh, um, stimulated too often for too long is a, a nuisance. That's not a good level. Then there is hypostress, which is the opposite of hyper stress, very low level of stress, uh, which occurs in an individual who is bored or unchallenged. For example, when you are promoted out of a position for some by somebody who wants to get rid of you, but promotes you to a position with a very big title of office, but without work, a very big title, and you are familiar with these things. Or you might be sent to a training uh, that is not relevant to your job. Um, it can be boring. Uh, people who experience hypostress uh, are often restless and uninspired. You are there days on end with a very big name on the door there, but if you enter, uh, the desk is just gathering the, the, the dust. It's, you, have, you don't do much in that office. So a factory worker, for example, can experience that hypo, hypo stress or somebody who does repetitive uh, jobs, you'll experience that. Yeah. Still talking about the nexus of stress and mental, mental health or mental wellness. So while hypo stress level of stress is generally considered not, uh, what is that word, is blocked by, blocked by, Um, is considered not, uh, it can have significant negative impacts over, over long term. I've lost a word there, but, but I think we can make sense out of it. Affecting Ampu. a person's, sorry? Harmful. Well, yeah. Harmful. Harmful, harmful, yes. While hyperstress level of stress is generally considered not harmful in the short term, it can have significant negative impacts over long term, affecting a person's motivation, performance, and uh, that's another block to what? I don't know. Somebody can read it from that end. Then there is the other level of distress, which is negative, um, destructive tension, extreme anxiety sorrow and pain, I think that word is, whatever it is, is a negative word. And counseling helps a person move from distress, which is that extreme, to eustress, which is useful, which we need to trigger us. So some, some stress management techniques for, for the individual. Ah, excuse me, managing stress allows your stress hormone levels to fall and helps you uh, flow on with whatever life brings to you. And um, adopting this strategy, the ABC strategy, that is being aware, having awareness of the stressors. Stressors are such things as you might not be aware of, things like WhatsApp messages, text messages, um, um, th th this, these sounds which, which are made when a message comes in through your phone and, and, mess and emails which pop up and you can see who it has come from, identifying this with, by sound, you can see that is from somebody you fear or that is somebody from perhaps from your boss. These things trigger the level of stress. And we are not aware of that by looking at that WhatsApp, checking the text message. And even before you finish with that, you remember there was an email that was coming. And one of the emails is showing that is from your boss and so on and reminding you of that deadline you have not met and so on. You need to be aware of what are the stressors, however mild, when they all come up at the same time streaming to your limited resource of energy and time, they cause stress. So, you should also, the B, 
aspect of the ABC strategy is the balance, is that balance to identify the thin line between the positive and negative stress, between you stress, which is good, and the bad stress. That line is very thin. You need to identify it. Be conscious about when do you, when does, when do you move from you stress uh, to hyper stress? When does hyper stress kick, kick in? And then the ability to control, to help yourself to combat negative stress. The best way uh, to do it is to have to be your self-controller, be aware and know when these things are cropping in. Even when the professionals are around to help you, you are your best helper. Um, I'm hoping that many of us who are listening to this presentation are not professionals in counseling. And, and we are saying that be aware what are the triggers. Uh, be aware, be, um, have adopt this strategy, be aware, identify the thin balance between good and bad stress, exercise self-control, and keep away from these things um, as far as possible. I know we need to meet certain uh, levels of expectations in life, but if you don't control yourself, those levels you want to uh, achieve will be farther away from you achieving them than if you do not try to manage your stress levels. Moving on quickly with the stress management, there are some supplement, supplements and foods which help this, for example, vitamin C. You can Google this and see how they do it to help the body to resist infections and for wound healing. They are found in th those, those, those sources listed. They are fresh fruits and juices, especially citrus and, and so on. You can read those from the notes when we share them with you. Zinc, for instance, to infection and for wood, wood, wound healing. They are found in red meat, uh, liver, egg yolk. Some of these products are listed there. Other sources will tell you that they are not good for your health. So it's a matter of balance. How much liver can you eat at a go? You will shortly have acid levels too high to, 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 to be able to be comfortable. So you need to take them with balance. Um, complex carbohydrates is another food that boosts energy and calm the mind. This, this is found in brown bread, you know it, oats, oats rice, uh, and so on. Then regular exercises, which we are told every day, and we imagine that we must go to the gyms or, or go racing, and you don't have to go that far. Do not wait till you can afford to buy or to go to a gym. Walk about the stairs. Don't always use a lift and you, unless, unless you are um, very, very old and cannot climb the stairs. The time will come when you will not be able to climb those stairs, but for now, Exercise, go up the stairs, you're not in a hurry. Uh, that comfort of a lift is not good for, for your lift. Play with your children and spouse. That's not far-fetched, I know it hardly happens, but find time for that, it's very healthy. Relaxation is the next one. Find time to relax. Go to for meditation uh, sites like the Heaven's Gate, don't go to Hell's Gate, that will give you more stress. Breathing exercises, when you concentrate in uh, breathing exercises, listening to music, good music. Because if you are a certain age, if you can listen to some music which is good, but what is it telling you? What is it causing you to do? Uh, do leisure and stro stroll, um, have stroll brisk walks. Don't run. I've seen cases of people who run from here to Utali College, from Nairobi to Utali College. One of them, actually, who I know, collapsed on his way back. So what is that? What was the effect of that? It, was, it didn't help. It didn't give, didn't, didn't give, give him a relaxation. So utilize counseling services. Counselor friends of mine, let us demystify counseling. Every one of us, including us counselors, are required to go through uh, regular uh, counseling because then whoever is counseling you, counseling you brings you to um, be aware of uh, what issues of uh, stress 
are creeping into your lives. Let's demystify counseling. It's not for the mad. This setting, excessive stress is, is managed by controlling and shipping. Uh, we have already talked about that. Um, and I don't know what words I'm covering there. Anyone who can read them for me? But uh, there, we, there we are, limit setting. Recognize the limits of your knowledge and expertise and do not try to, to impress others on things you don't know well how to do. They are experts. Uh, do what you know best and leave what you do not know to those who know it better uh, in, uh, under, the, under what we call the principle of comparative advantage. Leave those who know to do certain things better. To do, you will benefit more, but don't struggle too much to impress the rest that you know this, which you don't know very well how to do. Using timeout periods, these are rituals that allow us to step out um, and, and, and to, to manage our stress for all demands and replenish ourselves. Taking a break on vacation, is that vacation or vocation? Which be, can be given when you take those walks with your, with, with your children. Retreats and get away to resorts occasionally. Get away from it all. When you go to the farm to look at the cows and the chicken, if you have those, forget your phones and emails and WhatsApp and relax. Just listen to the cows uh, and feed them. Um, but don't go there carrying your office with you to those farms that's meant to give you relaxation. Go to nature reserves, nature trails, get, getting away from it all. Uh, for at least for a while. Laugh your way to the hell, to hell, that is better said than done, but you know that uh, if you get moments of laughter, sharing it with your colleagues, it takes you out of the stressful events and you definitely don't know what break you are giving to yourself and revigorizing yourself for the next uh, need for an, en an energy resource. Seeking spiritual replenishment. You know, professional sense making is enhanced when we seek out opportunities with coworkers to discuss values and beliefs, relationships in our works. Don't make your workplace a stressful place. Even though you spend 90% of your day in the office, we spend that 90% very miserably. Make it a place. If you have 90% of your life miserable, you are creating a condition for quick exit from this earth. So sort out professional motivations and suddenly comes to a stop without even being weak. But that's it I wanted to cover. I hope it's been useful. Uh, I will be, I'll be on standby for elaboration of certain aspects. Uh, thank you all. Okay, you can stop sharing. Thank you so much. Um, that Thank presentation you. on stress management. I like that topic. Laughing all the way to health. <laughs> so we can laugh our way to, to health. Okay, thank you, Justin, for that uh, good presentation. Thank uh, you, Dr. Harry. We are almost coming to the end of our session. But as we end, I'd like just to make uh, an announcement. Um, I don't know whether you can see what is on my screen. Yeah, yeah, we can see our photographs there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in December, from the from the fifth to the sixteenth, we are having a career choices and mentorship program. Uh, this is a program for young people between 10 years and 24 years, people who are considering cho choices in different careers. Now we are going to have different professionals, like we have Leopold who will be give, give, giving a talk on mob, mobile gamified health literacy program. He's going to involve the students uh, through games to learn more about mental health. We have Dr. Suleiman Mwangi, 
he's a dean at the at St. Paul's University. He'll be sharing about the teaching profession at the university level. I realize our children are not so much interested in being teachers, but they want to be professors. So he'll be telling them what it takes to be a professor. Mary Karongo will be talking about psychology. Uh, Delphi Mugwana will talk about uh, the importance of maybe become, doing become, uh, finance, accountancy, and so on. We have James Motinda, who is a TV director. He'll be talking about ICT and the media. Elizabeth will be talking about the medical profession. Then we have Catherine Muni, who is a lecturer at ZTEC University, talking about uh, hospitality mainly and tourism. Then Justin Kimani will also be among us. And he'll be talking about uh, what it takes to be a certified public secretary. And remember, he has many years of experience at KPLC, and he has served as the chairperson of Kiambu County Public Service Board. So you'll be sharing tips maybe on how to write an effective CV and what is required when one goes for interviews. Uh, agribusiness is very important, and Elizabeth Yegon will be talking about that. She is in charge of gender in the State Department of Crop Development and Agricultural Research. She's enthusiastic about agriculture. Then they'll also hear from Matimo Kinuthia, who will be doing presentations on what it takes to be an effective lawyer or an advocate. Then uh, Kevin Lanya is an actuary, and you'll be talking about what it takes to be an actuary. So we have lined up a number of presenters uh, for our young people. And therefore, just like you've been participating in these webinars, would like you to, and to register your child so that they can benefit. We are also going to have a lieutenant whom uh, we are discussing with so that they also learn about what it takes to, to work in the military. So those are some of the things that we have lined up for your children. The course is only 2000 and it takes place uh, for a period of two weeks. So we finalize our presentations. Uh, with the pastors. Now, the pastors are going to tell us whether uh, suicidal tendencies are in the churches and what happens there. How do pastors and, uh, assist those who have suicidal thoughts? And to start with, we are going to have uh, Dr. Claude. Uh, Dr. Cla Claude uh, is going to talk about suicide uh, cases in the church in South Africa. He has a PhD in practical theology, pastoral care and counseling with the University of Pretoria, an advanced religious specialist in Christian pastoral counseling, South Africa, and currently he is based in the UK. Uh, in the, he's a minister in the Methodist Church in Britain. But uh, he'll share about his experience in South Africa so that we see whether Kenya is very different from South Africa. And also we'll have another pastor who will share the experience in UK. So Dr. Claude, you are very much welcomed. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rebecca, and, and uh, greetings to all the participants and all the, the panelists. I think we are extensively been uh, fed by your presentation. And then uh, we really appreciate you. And then we are so proud for the work that you are doing in Kenya and then what really been presented this evening. Uh, I think as we said earlier on that uh, they've done all it's supposed to be given as theoretically speaking, we don't have anything that we can bring in there to explain what uh, suicidal is or what uh, the mental issue is. But bringing back to South Africa as uh, I was there from uh, 2002 to 2015. And you know, the church has exposed me to different uh, culture and context in uh, South Africa and moving around different provinces and where I was exposed to different races and you know what the setup of South Africa is. But uh, coming back to what it is here as uh, the, the, the reality is the same in our churches. And as I was in uh, 2006 I was in the PE and then uh, the situation came to my church one of the the leaders was a preacher 
and because it was dismissed at work and what happened and where we were we were it was like 30 kilometers to Port Elizabeth where the sea is and then he left a note to his parents that no okay you know what I'm, I'm done with everything you know you're not gonna see me again now it was my first appointment in that context and it happened that he, he did it again earlier on and then I was not there and he referred that to the parent that you need to see me either if you're not going to get me on time this is it i'm not going to be part of you anymore and the parents they came to me uh, we support to drive to drive from where we were we, i was 30 kilometers following the person and fortunately fortunately i don't know what's happened by god grace we found him in one on, on one of our churches that he was there to pray before he can go and do and finalize his attempt that he was planning in his life. That's a reality which we are facing as ministers in our churches. And then we're supposed now to start a process of counseling to get him in, to listen to him, and to be able to refer because we are so limited. By that time, as a minister, you cannot go through all this psychologist uh, therapy and other things. We start with the counseling session to listen to him and prepare to try to regain confidence of himself and to give some hope for him to be referred to a specialist or professionals for to journey with him as they've presented all the structures by our, our, our fellow presenter this evening. Now, as we can see, we know even the, 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 all, the HHOs, refer about what is happening in the world is quite extensive where the young people in South Africa, and then I was part of a, a cross-cultural attitude towards suicide among South African. It was a group where we went for a research together and get what really is happening amongst young people from high school where deciding to, to, to have those attempts of suicide and sometimes to attract themselves to, to, to be killed or to destroy the future of their lives because of the, 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 the bullying or either the stigma of different things or disappointment, or maybe she was dumped or dumped by a boyfriend or something. And I realized I was in Soweto in 2008 and we received in the office a child which really been cutting herself and then bleeding all over preparing to have those attempts because she was dumped by a boyfriend, remember, around 14 years old to 15 years old. And then all the professionals have explained all the cause of uh, uh, those attempts, but I, I, I was there with children very young in their age because of that disappointment and then trying to have those attempts of suicide. These, those are realities happening in our church. And when we, we receive them, the first thing is to just to try to accommodate and to listen to them, to give them that confidence, to, give, to show them that support before they can be referred and praying about. Because another element in our churches, when someone can go through aspect like a, our brother that explained his experience, how he went through different sequence of, of life where he could not even stand again because of addiction, by God's grace, there's prayer that can come in to help the person, but you need to be very careful to start demonizing the, the situation because it can be emotional, it can be also uh, something which it can be treated if the follow up and the prevention or maybe to get it on time for the person to be really called to order or to help with that support structure the church can offer for the person to be getting back to his senses. But what I've observed through my ministry, most of them, it was uh, drinking alcohol. It's quite something that was uh, on the top of the list. And then you see it was the, the, the most of the freaking method they were using there for the people that have received in different contexts, having attempt of suicide, it was sometimes self poisoning like uh, our friends that is explaining about you want to, 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 to kill himself from uh, the poison. Self poisoning was really common in different contexts because I remember I was in another context where, where they brought a child, want to, 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 to have those attempts because the mother divorced the father on a domestic violence or discussion made the child 12 years old start trying to have those attempts because of the fight 
between the parents or the divorce that occurred. She was not expecting that thing and then was about to do so. Another one is about drug overdoses. I've realized that most of the time we receive young people or either not young people, those maybe above 50, been using the drug and the overdose of those subsistence made people not to sustain themselves. Now, as a church, remember, we need just to receive and to start listening for to create that support structure in different ways in a youth perspective or either to see in which way those are uh, mature in the church to join with them in some stages where they can be referred to the professionals to be attended and to be helped for them to be able to come back to their lives. Another element in South Africa is about self-stabbing. You know, the people they can step themselves or either just to, to stop everything that's surrounding them because of lack of uh, means or poverty or the context where they were, uh, the surrounding, the environment or the peers the, the around them, not allowing them exactly to define their life and to see themselves with their feet to do things which they are called to do or to see them going through some uh, positive realities of their, their lives. I was, I was again uh, in a place called in the south of South Africa in Johannesburg, and then we're dealing with an issue with uh, a young person which is hanging himself because of they could not they could not get along with the stepmother. And then uh, the the latest that you see himself is to hanging himself or for to stop life and to do other things. Those are a point which I've dealt with in my ministry practically, regardless of what the theory are, but there are realities which you cannot stop because people, they are forced to have those attempts because of the realities that they are, they are funding themselves in. It become quite dangerous. And then the church, what we put on ground is about to create support structure, support ground where we things like that can happen. Sometimes we got the news late, but fortunately, if it can arrive as on time and we can be able to genuinely the family to assist them how ah, they can try to bring the person to a senses or a senses for to change the dynamic that's surrounding them the shadow of death which are pushing them to do whatever that they can do and then uh, that another thing uh, that's what was common in south africa i remember in a there's a place called ponte city there, there are people when they want to kill themselves, it was a, a, a building of 57, if I'm not mistaken, 58 stores. It was too tall around Berea in South Africa. People, most of the people were going in there and going to the top of that because it's a, it was like a circle. And then they throw themselves in there to just to terminate their lives. And those are moves which it was quite common when it's gonna be on the news and someone else can also attempt to do so because of what they've seen and limited their lives in that uh, perspective. And also starvation, some other people they've decided just no, I'm not gonna eat, I'm not gonna do anything because I'm, I'm done with whatever situation that I'm going through. It was so common in my ministry. But what I'm trying to bring to your attention here, most of it, we were trying to do what we can, pray for them, but we found also the cultural, the cross-cultural dynamic of uh, others that believe in the ancestors and different things which we found that they can demonize the situation or either they can define it differently to say, okay, this is the ancestors are calling someone to do different things. That's why he's having that mind. Now we, we were between lines to balance the thing between the spiritual part and the, also the ancestral, the tradition, which to, to, to join them together to make the family to understand that this is can be emotional, it can be something, is a game mental illness that you can take someone to professionals or either they will take someone to the Sangomas or other people to try to discern what is happening in the life of their children or their one, their loved one that are going through this attempt to kill themselves. Those are challenges that we are referring to that we need to see that uh, uh, the prevention is very important by awareness as other professionals have said around here and the church we're trying our best to create some uh, 
Bible study or maybe to claim some advocacy where people understand that sometimes it is not only the spiritual part to demonize the situation, to discern if the person is sick or is the mental illness, to refer those people to professionals to be attended. And then us, we can pray as throughout we are creating that support structure. And we, we, are, we, are, we are asking the rest of the context to get the message across is not about demonizing everything that is coming in that level of mental illness, especially for suicide uh, attempts. We need to be able to bring the people to understand the position of either they are sick or is not only the traditional part or responding to the ancestors call or something else which can make someone to take that direction. I really appreciate what I've listened to. And then through my experience in my ministry, I think is what I've experienced around this topic. I think I've responded to a few lines which uh, to support the rest of the professionals that they've presented before me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Claude, for that uh, uh, very useful presentation. And I think from your discussion, I think experiences in Kenya are similar to what is happening in South Africa. Right. And also the clergy also do their work, but uh, we also need to consult the professionals. We work hand in hand. So we offer counseling, but at the same time, they also need to seek mental health mental health advice or treatment. So thank you so much. I don't know whether Reverend uh, Francis is around. Yeah, he's around, I saw him. Uh, Reverend Francis, are you there? Yeah, yes, I'm here, yeah, thank you. Okay, you can share briefly. Uh, uh, hello everyone, and uh, uh, my apologies for coming late. I had a very long meeting. And uh, sometimes when you come late, when other people have spoken, uh, sometimes you become a spoiler. So allow me just to take two minutes. Okay. Uh, since I got this topic, I took time to consult. This is a uh, standing order, uh, providing biological positions for issues that people face in a society. And therefore I have not come across a biological uh, position in regard to suicide. But suicide, having said that suicide as an aggressive behavior and as a cutting edge theme across the globe. Uh, I, 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 I need to bring this into light that uh, religious people have different positions in regard to suicide. And I'm not going to bring it here uh, because it is a debatable uh, position. Now, when, when we look at the factors also that cause suicide, they are also cutting across issues and I'm not going to bring them here. But what we need to know that uh, we, as religious people, we can uh, approach a suicide from what I call clinical uh, pastoral position. And the reason I'm saying like that is because uh, we are regarded as core creators with God and therefore we are responsible uh, for those around us. If we are responsible for those around us, then the church religious institutions exist uh, to provide support as Dr. Claudia has, has, has said. Now, from, from, from a, a clinical pastoral positions is that in UK, uh, before I came to UK, I think uh, 30 years ago, my experience of suicide is, uh, was related to my brother, who was a police officer. Uh, my brother and uh, issues uh, that I would say they are cutting across issues, which I don't think is important to, to respect them here. But he had uh, cutting across issues related to misuse of alcohol and, and drugs. And sometimes exposed to harmful things. The same way here in the UK, what I see a lot, a lot of young people are exposed to what I call cyber bullying. Many of them are exposed to cyber bullying. And uh, others, of course, are exposed to so many harmful behaviors. But there's a law sometimes for religious leaders that restrict. Uh, you getting to know what is happening in families. 
And therefore, if you are, don't have a consent, what is happening to a family for someone who has uh, taken their lives, it becomes uh, very difficult other than uh, being there to provide the support. Lastly, maybe what I can say is uh, my positions and the position of the church here that I work is to have a, an approach of what we call bereavement care for a related suicide cases, a bereavement care a package or a program whereby we make ourselves available to the family and the family, if they wish to share the story related to the suicide, then you are there physically there to listen and to provide any, any support they require. And sometimes uh, they may not say they don't want a church related funeral and therefore they will pick what they call a humanist person uh, to facilitate a funeral of such a nature because the family might say uh, they are not believers or the person who has committed uh, the suicide is a not a, a faith, a, doesn't have a faith. So in most cases, the church uh, approaches suicide from a non-condemnation approach. And I'm sure you agree with me, uh, uh, most of the religious people position is they condemn suicide as a sin. So from this side, <laughs> I don't do that. And neither I think also uh, uh, pastors do that uh, because of what, again, they are calling issues related with uh, safeguarding issues or issues related to abuse, abusing a family, or contextualizing a problem of a family. And therefore we tread carefully in issues related to suicide. Uh, in this place because uh, uh, the family again wishes not to share a father. So, so, so as a church, as a religious uh, uh, position, I think that what I can say, we exist as a religious society uh, to provide a briefing, a, a, a brief briefment, a pastoral care when the family requires us. I think that's what I can share to the forum and thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Reverend Francis. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I think it's a summary of what we have gone through, although you are not there in the beginning, but you're right on track. And I can see comments uh, in the chat. Uh, many are grateful that Crispus was able to share uh, his story and many are encouraged. I don't know who among the panelists can answer this. Somebody is saying that, uh, she does not feel like committing suicide, but she feels like going very far from people where she can start life again. I don't know who can answer that or who can comment. You may not be planning to kill yourself. I, 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 feel, I Can I say I felt like that almost 40 years ago, I'm 50 years plus now. Mm -hmm. But I felt the same thing. And uh, I think the causes of that was, uh, I felt uh, the family was not giving me an attention. Mm -hmm. I felt isolated in a family and I found there's no meaning to life. So mm -hmm. I went out uh, from where we're living in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Skariobang South, they call it K-South in uh, next to Buruburu. So I wanted to go and throw myself to thicker highway before it was a thicker before now it's super highway i wanted to take go disappear take my life i i i think grace says we can go disappear and start life somewhere afresh <laughs> uh, but but myself i wanted to leave this world but a voice spoke to me as i was walking toward thicker was heading to mcquen a voice came and said you stupid boy, where do you think you're going? And that was a transformation for my life. I faced the challenges that I was facing and I began to look life positively. And God took hand of me, walked with me. And because that, that's what, what I can say, I never shared with anybody. I never, after today, actually, you are, maybe you are the first person to hear this. God walked with me. And I shared that story with God. God healed my heart. And here I am today. 
Amen. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So there is hope. You don't need to disappear to the unknown. There is hope for tomorrow. I can see Anne Murungi has raised her hand. Anne, it's your opportunity. You can say something. Madam Rebecca, for the opportunity. Yes. I think I wanted to mention something to Madam Grace. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I also would want to share and say I'm, I'm about 40 now. And Maybe you can, ago, speak, you can speak a bit louder. I'm saying I'm 40 now. Yes. And uh, when I was in college some 20, 20, 19 years ago, I was going through the same thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I discovered uh, with the help of a uh, counselors that I was going through what I call rejection. Again, mm -hmm. it was coming from family and upbringing and the stigma of living in a malfunctioning home and everybody thinking that you are not okay or complete maybe because you're being raised by a single parent. And it was bad, bad enough. I attempted suicide myself thrice. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I, I talked to a counselor and uh, I, I walked through the journey of uh, accepting myself and knowing that I'm complete, and uh, what I said and felt about myself is what mattered. That feeling of wanting to disappear. Because when I attempted thrice and I wasn't successful, and I wanted to run away and never appear anywhere. Um, that feeling disappeared, and now I feel I belong. I feel now responsible. I can stretch out my hands and also help others that are going through the same. So there is hope for Grace. She says mm -hmm. she needs help. I would advise her to seek help from a counselor and someone who is going to work with her the journey. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that very good response. So there is hope. You can seek counseling and as other others have been able to move forward, I'm sure you'll also be able to, to move forward. Okay, is there somebody else who wants to say something? Um, right, can, have, can I say? Yes. Uh, just a quick one about uh, Kimaru and his uh, testimony. Uh, I've posted some comments uh, uh, on the chat, uh, but reacting to that question of uh, running away from the current environment to another one, to me, uh, that would appear to be a temporary uh, relief, but it will come to haunt you later on. And perhaps the example of Kimaru is the best. Take courage, uh, share your experience with others, and you. I, I would like to meet him and find out how does he feel now sharing that. He must be enjoying the whole lot because He's really helping so many people to see that they, people can recover. When you run away from that experience to avoid the dominant uh, environment, to keep haunting you and wanting to go back. So my, my advice, let me call it advice, is that you gather courage and share your testimony and you'll be helping a lot more people, which is fulfilling, like we have heard from Kimaru. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Justin, for that. Now, Dennis Masese is asking, Kenya, in Kenya, we have a law criminalizing suicide in the constitution. Could it be a contributing factor to persons attempting suicide as one of the signs of suicide tendency is hiding? Is it because it's against the law and that's why people hide when they are planning to uh, commit suicide or to attempt? I don't know, I would like to answer that. Okay, Anne Murungi, you'd like to say something? Yes, I would want to say something. Mm -hmm. I, I believe reasons as to why people hide when they want to commit suicide is because some something may be deep within them. Like I said, I, I tried thrice. Tells you that you don't want anyone to know and you want to go away as quickly as possible. That is vacate these others quickly as possible. 
So I don't think really it could be a motivation as to why people hide when they want to commit suicide. Because that time when I wanted to do it, I wasn't aware about the law and its provisions. But again, I would also say, I, I, I would uh, advocate for decriminalization of suicide in Kenya because some of the reasons why people commit suicide are mental. If these people are, uh, are made to go through therapy and through mental uh, and help, they're able to come out and live out of these things other than get them and when they survive, throw them in jail, you know, at the end of the day, we have not helped uh, solve the problem. We have just cured the symptoms, but the, the, the root cause is still there. And given a chance, they'll still commit it right there in prison or even after they have left prison. So I advocate for the criminalization of that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, we, this is our fourth webinar. I think I told you from the beginning and we have talked about uh, different issues and one of the, uh, the key area that we have mentioned is that happiness is one of the solutions. Looking for activities that one loves doing, it could be hobbies or whatever you'd like or you enjoy doing. If you can do much of that, I think it will bring down the stress, the stress uh, feelings or the st the, those feelings of stress. It can bring them down and uh, some of these mental health issues will be managed. Okay, thank you, uh, Anne, for that. And I think, uh, Malib, yes? Do you want, Malib, can I throw a spanner that uh, we, we have looked at suicide in a different perspective, but I think also we need to look at it from a religious persuasion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thinking of the bombers, bombers, sorry. Uh, people tie themselves with bombs and uh, uh, so, so, so we need to look at it other than actually being a mentor, uh, mm -hmm. uh, look at, at it from a cultural uh, point of view. Okay, I think it's yeah, also it, cultural. Yeah, yeah that's, what, that's what I was saying. It's a cutting edge topic issue. It's yeah. cutting so many things. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. I don't know whether somebody else has a comment. Um, good evening. I would like to comment on Grace's case. Um, that feeling of just running away and never to interact with people, maybe she's been working with and everything. I, I must confess that I've had those kind of experiences many times. Um, for me, it's not necessarily suicidal, my own experience, but um, it is tied to my type of job. I run a small CBO and um, I do back-to-back -back sessions with very broken cases. You have um, issues of addiction, issues of uh, sexual perversions, you know, you have issues to do with, you know, all across board. And uh, I am this person that people think that I have the solutions and I don't know how to say no. So I, I work during the day I end at night, in the morning you have sessions and everything and I reached to a point of uh, serious burnouts. And I started feeling like um, I am losing even interest in my own, um, like nothing really makes sense. I feel now misused. I feel like I don't have strength even to support myself. Now, wh what I did, I decided to just take a, a, a break uh, for a week and I took like kind of vacation away from Nakuru. I went to some other places, but at least there was somebody whom I account to. I'm like, hey, I feel like I'm giving up. I feel I'm tired mentally, emotionally. I was very, very bad, serious um, burnout. So I went out, but um, somebody's in touch. Keep texting me, how, how are you doing? I hope you're doing well. And then sending me a word or two. But again, at that particular point, I didn't receive any calls. I did not respond to any text. I, I told everybody, uh, even in my emails, you send me an email and there's a revert, like uh, for office matters, reach out to my colleague and so on and so forth. So that one week I was able to really recover and um, at least re, you know, refresh. So it could be because maybe of the nature of job or too much expectation from your family members, maybe you haven't resolved issues and 
you really don't know how to work it out. So I would recommend maybe a vacation, but again, uh, talking to a therapist who helps you to like put issues, like separate issues. Because at the end of the session, I had a, um, a very productive session, uh, therapy, and I was able to identify exactly what is this that is pulling me down over and above the fact that I'm supporting others. So yeah, so I'm able to do um, as I was guided by the counselor, and at least I can say today I'm, I'm strong and I still can uh, go a few miles. So a vacation would help talking to a therapist. Uh, that is my experience from last week, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Martha, for that uh, contribution. Uh, the importance of having a break and the importance of therapy. So we need to talk more and I can see uh, Ngushi would like to say something. Ngushi, this is your opportunity. Yeah, thank you, uh, Daktari, uh, for the good representations and uh, all about stress. And uh, what came to my mind uh, about st stress? I think, or, uh, as it has already been mentioned, all of us go through various degrees of stress. But I think our reaction or our response to stress is key to whether we use stress positively or the stress affects us negatively. And I'm looking at it from uh, the experiences of people like Apostle Paul, where he wrote uh, the prison epistles, like the Philippians, when he was in jail. But he was able to overcome the overwhelming stress of being in jail. And he wrote very powerful episode of rejoice, and I say again, rejoice, which means he was not, his life was not uh, driven by his circumstances or situation, but he could be able to face life and the reality of life and be able to respond to it in a positive manner, which even today do affect all those who lead, lead uh, the book of Philippians. So to me, when we talk about uh, stress, uh, I think we really need to give it uh, paradigm shifts where stress can be overcome. If we have that mindset that looks at things from a positive aspect, knowing that you have a purpose in life in this world. Apostle Paul knew his purpose. He knew he had to write the books. He wrote uh, the piece of, uh, prison epistles. And even as we have a purpose in life, so as we face various challenges and difficult, difficulties in life, because life is not a roller coaster, all of us will go stressed one time or the other. So how we respond to it, I think will either make us over, be overcomers or let the stress take control of us. And I hope not. Just an observation. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Gushe, for that. Uh, the biblical perspective. And it is how we react that uh, determines how, how we'll be able to overcome the stress like we've been told. Uh, is there another person who would like to share something or we are okay now? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, is there a, a split of a minute? I can uh, respond to that last comment from uh, about the attitude towards stress. It's quite true. And you remember we talked about the various levels mm -hmm. and some of, we see that some of that stress is positive the response is uh, should search as to whether the stress is 
to trigger or prompt um, need to attend to something which is helpful. Um, so I appreciate that comment that some of it can be negative, but it needs to be perceived, depending on its level, as positive. Uh, because if you don't have that, you uh, uh, you stress, for example, you will fail in your target. So why is the stress coming, and at what level? You remember that thin man margin. It's what we need to design the thin man margin between the various levels. And once you know that there is a thin margin, and you need to really critique. Uh, you'll be able to find to see that some of that st stress is not all a bad thing. Some of it is positive. So I just wanted to comment on that last observation. It's quite valid. Okay. All right. I think uh, we have come to the end of our presentation. I can see Anne Murungi says, awesome session. Keep it up. So we thank you for sparing time to be with us this evening. And we look forward to many more sessions. So as I said, uh, for the between 5th and 16th December, we'll have a, a, we'll have a schedule for a session for career mentorship and career choices. So we are going to have different professionals who will talk to our young people on what it takes to, to be involved in different professionals. So I thank you, all of you, for coming. And yes, Justin, I am seeing you are showing a parents magazine. Because it has very good articles on uh, mental health, as you can see. Uh, okay. If you can get hold of it, is the current one. And uh, Dr. Jenga, who, as you know, is heading the, um, the, the, the crusade on mental health, has written an article there and quite a few other uh, okay. things coming just on time when we are sharing this you can get hold of a copy parents magazine okay all right thank you all right some people are asking for the notes others for the link i'll share the link uh, after this because we have uh, uh, recorded the session so thank you once again for coming and i would request uh, brother ngushi to close the meeting with a word of prayer yeah, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you, we glorify the holy name. We thank you and praise you, Almighty God, because you have given unto us a uh, spirit, not of fear, but of a sound mind. Okay, and here, in it. Of sound mind and uh, uh, of power and of love, and we are most grateful for the various contributions that have already been done. May you help us, oh Mary God, to view stress, which is part of life, because life is not a roller coaster. That, oh Mary God, we can be able to view it positively and have a purpose in life so that we can be fruitful and use that energy, uh, that uh, you stress energy for good. And we pray that, oh, Mary God, that even those who are planning and having suicidal thoughts, that you will touch them and give them this vision and this understanding, delivering them from those stress, suicidal stress uh, tendencies, so that, Lord, they can have a purpose in life and be fruitful and productive. We thank you, Lord, even for the organizer, uh, Dr. Rebecca, who has done a great job, all the participants, oh God. May you bless them for the great work that they are doing. And all those who joined, oh Lord, I pray that it was fruitful to each one of us. And as we depart, be with us, oh Lord, and give unto us a peaceful night. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Thank you. I'll be posting the, the video in my YouTube channel, Dr. Rebecca Wambua, so you can check there. And also you can watch my previous episode. So thank you very much and God bless you. <laughs>